Now, I'd like to really introduce also another special guest, and that's Spencer Wesley. Spencer, can you stand up? Spencer is a sophomore at Hope, and he's our intern. He's our intern. Where's Spencer? We're really happy to have him. He kind of left class a little bit early, but that's okay. Okay, I'll be quiet. And you know, it's just great, especially having someone so early in his life joining us. And so we're really happy to have him here. Yeah, so that's good. Well, as you know, we're all in the midst of celebrating an anniversary, a milestone, Hope College's 150th year. If you attended Hope's weekend happening in January, you had the opportunity to hear Drs. Bruins, Vosco, and Ninehouse presentation, How Rocky, uh, How Rocky Was the Road to Hope's Success. So today, they're going to talk about some nuggets of history that are going on, that are revealing, and maybe you don't know those about Hope College. So to coincide with Dr. Vosco's presentation, I thought that I would reveal a few nuggets and facts about HASP as some of you may know and some of you may not know. Now, I don't have any names associated with these. You can see me later, and if I have permission, I might reveal who the people are. You might be able to guess. HASP is a fairly young organization. As you know, we're only 28 years old and this coming May, but we've really achieved a lot. And time today doesn't really allow me to say all the wonderful things that are going on. So I'm gonna use the Letterman top 10 thing, although I have 12, I just couldn't cut it down. <laughs> but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some things you may not know. HASP is dedicated to ensuring that HOPE students present well in performance. Did you know that two of our members, I call them Vesper godparents, are so dedicated to Hope Vespers that they've actually purchased black socks for the members of the choir to ensure that they are dressed for success. <laughs> this is true. HASS offers not only lifelong learning, but travel, publishing, volunteering, current informative programming, collegial fellowship, and significant hoop support to Hope Sports. One member of our special events committee is so astute at the business of planning trips down to every detail that when a trip was organized to visit the racing world Keeneland in Kentucky, the tour guides from Keeneland were invited to our hotel the night before the tour to review how to read a racing sheet <laughs> and to comprehend the ins and outs of thoroughbred horse racing. Now I thought this presentation added greatly to our love of lifelong learning. We have a member who has never given up teaching. He retired, he joined HASP, and he immediately applied for a teaching position. To date, he has given 29 classes with tests, but he's failed to submit the grades. Somehow the grades are, are I don't know where they are. He's a very popular professor, and I believe because the tests somehow are overlooked. So sit back and enjoy. I heard from a reliable uh, several months ago that HASP was recommended by a local physician to one of his patients as a great organization to join. So we're awaiting FDA approval now to add to our credentials. <laughs> we are a continuum of educational opportunities with summer and fall and winter spring terms with an average of 40 courses per semester with HASP members as a majority of the presenters and hope faculty not too far behind. And did you know that the whole faculty really appreciate teaching a class at Hass? Because when the class is over, the cell phones do not come out immediately, okay? <laughs> and people kind of have time to linger, uh, and they go up and they actually interact with a professor and ask pertinent questions, and they love that. They just love being quizzed. During the past five years, Hass members have filled 722 requests for classroom participation from Hope faculty. So hanging out with Hope students is one of the popular things that Hass really enjoys. And through our Hass Service Committee, members have contributed 2,000 volunteer hours a year to various programs within the community. I think one of the favorite one is baggy books within the school system, reading to the children and giving them an opportunity to then go home and read with their parents and enhance their reading skills. And we have many people volunteer for that program. It was wonderful. Uh, the trolley guys, of course, you know, are, are all from Hass pretty much, and they spend close to 1,000 hours in preparation for the Tulip Time Festival and their tours. I'd like to talk about two HASP HOPE collaborations. A HASP member who appreciates musical performance recently opened his home to HASP 
and the community for a very lovely Sunday afternoon recital supporting a Hope Music student from Uganda. The student is a jazz musician and he plays some of his own compositions artists on a beautiful Steinway piano. And I can give testimony to the students of Hope College and Holland. He, he, all his life he said he dreamed uh, when he was here in this area playing in different towns of coming to Holland and being accepted to Hope College. So there he was, Sunday afternoon, performing for the community, showcasing his love of jazz, of music, and his appreciation of Hope College. And the other collaboration is kind of interesting. This is between a Haas member and a Hope football team player. They were the first on the scene when a parent who was visiting Hope on visitation day uh, had a fainting spell uh, during a laboratory tour while we were demonstrating an IV insertion. Uh, I, think it was the, I think it was the red food color in the IV tubing. And so the good news is that we were right there. The patient recovered really well. And the even better news is that next semester they chose Hope. So they were here for the semester. And they, it was just great. Um, and you know, for the month of February, Here's a Valentine's Day story. Last semester, Dr. Temple Smith requested that we have some couples come to her sociology class. She wanted people who had long years of marriage, and Hope was, uh, Hass was very easily able to fulfill that request. We had three couples from our membership who have been married for a combined total of 171 years. They told me not to reveal their ages. So this isn't this a great role model for the students here. You know, it's, it's just wonderful. And finally, you know, I want to say, I just couldn't say everything, but I think that if I looked long enough that I could find a little nugget of history and contribution uh, about every Haas member and what they've contributed to Haas. So go Haas and go Hope. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I, I, wait, I just have to say this one quick thing. I had to take this out, but we're an organization that truly knows the nutritional value of a good cookie. I had to put that in. You know, we have cookies at all the meetings, so I think that's good. Betty Voskel now, who is the chair of our membership committee, is going to introduce our new members and greet our guests. Thank you, Terry. Good morning. I'd like to warmly welcome all of our visitors this morning, and we do have quite a few, including my husband of 50 years, Dennis Voskel, and our guests from Ben Ralty Institute, as well as a host of other visitors. We have seven new Haas members to introduce this morning, so I'll ask the members to come on up when I read your name, uh, and we'll warmly receive you into our membership. David Blatt, mentors Herb and Ann Weller, Chris Grant, Mike Grant, mentors Karen and David Swart, Bill Haynes, Janet Haynes, mentors Don and Bonnie Cowie, Kathy Schoolmeister, Paul Schoolmeister, mentors Nettie Van Dynan. So uh, welcome <laughs> to all of you, and let's give them a round of applause. All right, now for our great program. Uh, Karen mishmer Heisen, who is a member of our program committee, is going to introduce our speaker for today. Well, Dennis is going to tell us 10 things we may not know about Hope. And so I tried to think of a few things you might not know about him. <laughs> we overlapped 10 years in the religion department, or what Ann Farley fondly called Vatican Row. He was a much loved and well respected professor, and during the drop ad weeks, he would take as many students as wanted into his intro classes, saying, They paid their tuition, they can take my class. And Betty, while you were traveling the globe teaching healthful living and, and eating and nutrition, your children ate Fruit Loops and Count Chocula. 
and other junk food for breakfast, but they were happy. And Dennis loves sports, we all know that. And two words heard in one sentence in the hallway of lovers about Nuno or basketball were Dennis and elbows. He bleeds orange and blue, and if he ever got sick, he would choose to ride in on a gurney rather than miss a hope game. <laughs> His family must have known that he was destined for a life and a, a career in religion because on their farm they had four new kittens which he named Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> but alas, one day, his mother backed the car out of the garage and she rode over three of the kittens. His sister screamed, the car lurched forward, and they got the other one. <laughs> Dennis said, there they went, all four gospels in just a matter of seconds. <laughs> I have more stories, but let's hear some things we really want to know. Please welcome Dennis. Bosco. Well, I had no idea that she actually knows those stories. It's quite a remarkable. Um, I got to turn this on. There we go. Is that is that on? Um, Karen was a wonderful secretary assistant to the religion department and it was an honor to have her as a friend as well as a colleague. Well, today um, I'm going to speak about the 10 things that some of you don't know, uh, a lot of you I hope don't know, maybe most of you don't know, so the title could change because I look around and I realize that you know an awful lot, a lot of you know a lot about, awfully lot about Hope College. But, like many of you, uh, I am neither a native of West Michigan nor a graduate of, of Hope College. Go Badgers! <laughs> Thank you! However, as an outsider uh, who served on the faculty for 17 years and now uh, have colleagues on the Van Ralty Institute, uh, I have deep appreciation and deep affection for this strong and fine institution. This year, of course, we celebrate our 150th anniversary. 150 years ago this July, the first eight graduates of Hope College were honored. To lay claim to venerability, most institutions, most colleges and universities date their origins as early as they can, perhaps to the time when the first freshman class was organized or to the time when the seed of that institution began, in our case, the uh, Pioneer School in 1851. Nope. Modestly, typically, Hope College dates its origins to the first graduating class in 1866. This morning, in light of the anniversary, I will focus on the history of Hope College. This is not a comprehensive history of the institution. For that, you'll have to wait until this summer when the Van Ralty Institute and my colleagues and friends are or over in that area, when we release an extensive study, I don't want to say exhaustive, you may not want to read it, but an extensive study of the institution called Keeping Hope Alive, a sesquicentennial history of Hope College, 1866 to 2016. Now, uh, as I said, many of those who wrote chapters for that, and this is edited by Jack Neinheis and uh, James Kennedy, uh, they're here this morning, so they certainly know uh, more than uh, a little about Hope College. But the 10 things you don't know, supposedly, that's the premise. First, you do not know that the underlying motivation for the establishment of Hope College was to provide theological training for those who would serve the recently arrived colonists uh, in the Midwest. Now, even before Albertus Van Ralty, and thousands of emigrants left the Netherlands, plans were being made for establishing an educational institution which would serve the needs, the religious needs of the colonies. They first settled here, they built an educational system. First they used the parochial schools, I mean the public schools because uh, they could afford that, that was supplied by the tax money of the area. But then they uh, had parochial elementary schools and then the Pioneer School in 1851 
uh, and that became the Holland Academy. Uh, and like they would say during that time, that was a seed for Hope College. Now, as important as undergraduate training was for the, uh, uh, the colonists, they were pious. And theological training was what they really had as their ultimate goal. In 1866, when seven of the first eight graduates of the institution received approval from the General Synod of the Reformed Church to receive ministerial training temporarily at Hope College, a theological department was established. In effect, Hope College became a theological seminary. When a financial crisis uh, led the denomination to suspend the theological department in 1877, the Midwestern Reformed churches were so irate, they were so, they made such a fuss that the denomination was forced to restore the theological department in 1884. The next year, the General Synod decided to reconstitute that theological department at Hope College as a separate institution with its own board of directors, its own budget, and its own faculty. Voila, Western Theological Seminary. Now in 2002, this reminds me that it took a long time for people to truly understand that, there was a, that these were separate institutions, as they have been since 1885. In, eight, in, nine, in 2002, when the Marvin and Jereen uh, Theological Center was being uh, planned and uh, money was raised for it, the Grand Rapids Press headlined the occasion. This was the headline. Hope Seminary Seeks Expansion Funds. <laughs> well, I was serving at Western Seminary as the president at that time, and I just simply shook my head. I couldn't believe it. They messed that up after 100 years, or more than 100 years. I have often contended, uh, John, uh, that a good percentage of the funds which have been given through the church or through the churches actually was intended for Hope Seminary. <laughs> so, pay up. <laughs> Second, did you know that for a brief shining moment, Hope College was a university, Hope Haven University. Just a year after the General Synod uh, of the Reformed Church temporarily approved those uh, uh, graduates to have a theological training at Hope College, President Philip Phelps, the first president, and the governing council of Hope College uh, proposed an ambitious plan uh, for transforming this fledgling college into a university. In a special report to the General Synod in, in 1868, Phillips argued that since the college already possessed a postgraduate department, the theological department, we were already, uh, in effect, a university. Now, the report also envisioned future graduate departments of science and law, and uh, Phillips and the council even proposed a new name for this institution, Hope Haven University. And they even came up with a, a logo or a... Uh, mascot, if you will, and it was a flourishing tree, much like Stanford University's tree. And uh, if, you, if you, you can see a little bit on that, that it says on the top, Hope Haven University, and on the bottom is the motto for the Reformed Church, Eindracht macht macht, in unity comes strength. So uh, this was a stationary, this is from a stationary, uh, a piece of uh, stationary that Phelps had made for his personal use. The General Synod of the Reformed Church uh, appointed a council, uh, actually appointed the Council of Hope, the leadership of the, of the institution, and had financial responsibility for the institution. And they debated this proposal. But in the end, they decided not to approve it because the college was not mature enough or strong enough or large enough. In the words of the committee that recommended not to approve this uh, university plan, <laughs> A university of 50 students, no funds and paper professorships can command or command no respect and does not meet the proper ideal of the term. I think most of us would agree with that today. <laughs> it was an overreach. Uh, when the General Senate voted down the university proposal, however, it did say when the, when the first constitution of the, college, of the college came out that if they raised the endowment funds, they could use the name Hope Haven University. Hope Haven University, John, that sounds 
very interesting, very intriguing, and very expensive. <laughs> He's shaking his head, no, forget it, it's not going to happen. Um, third, did you know that Hope College once owned 833 acres of what is now known as the Wakazoo Woods on the north side of Lake Makatawa, some of the most valuable property in West Michigan. Now in 1862, Phelps and Van Ralty decided to, uh, with the approval I think of the governing council, decided to purchase extensive acreage on the north side of Black Lake. They paid $9,400 for that. To secure the down payment, they had to dip into the endowment funds of the college. And I think that's right. Uh, Bob Swearinga will correct me afterwards, I'm certain. Now, this pair uh, believed that it was a wise investment. They decided that they wanted to make this a fruit farm. And later, they wanted to make it a resort and thought it would bring in monies for the college. The profits would uh, support the college. Now, to, uh, to, rest to restore that endowment, uh, Van Ralte took one of his many trips to the east uh, and uh, asked the wealthy members there and the churches to support this plan and to give him the money to make up the endowment uh, loss. Well, in fact, and this is important for us to understand in the Midwest, in addition to financial assistance which came from the eastern churches, they also supplied the college with its first faculty members and with its first presidents. I am certain that we would not be here today if it were not for the eastern section of the Reformed Church's support, continued support for Hope College. Now, the benefactors were reluctant to uh, go along with, their, with uh, paying that uh, $10,000 down payment. They thought that the farm project was a dead horse, as they called it. But Van Ralty finally convinced uh, James Sudam uh, to donate $10,000 and uh, William Moore to give $4,000 to help develop the farm. Meanwhile, Hope Haven Farm, uh, and by the way, on one map it says Hope Haven Lake, or Lake Makatawa, or the Black Lake as it was called in those days. Well, extensive visions. Pe presidents have to be visionary. Anyway, the, uh, it, uh, you know that none of this came to fruition. But the property did increase in value it was sold by President Collin in 1902 for uh, $25,000. They sold it to investors from Holland and Chicago. But I still wonder, 833 acres of lakefront land <laughs> along Lake Makatawa. Wow. Imagine. Imagine what that would be worth today. Fourth, did you know that the first president of Hope College was relieved of his position but refused to vacate his residence in Van Black Hall for six years. <laughs> it's true. Philip Phelps, who was a graduate of Union College in Schenectady, New York, which the Reformed Church helped to uh, organize and build. Uh, Van Ralty went to the East, got to know him, and recruited him to come back and run the academy, but to turn it into, eventually, a college. A wonderful instructor, uh, instructor and administrator. He was much loved and admired by people in the church. And he was given responsibility for shaping the institution while Van Ralty went out to raise the money from Easterners. Now, when the General Synod did not support his university plan, uh, Phelps began to encounter serious opposition because uh, of the expense of running the college and the fact that the denomination was putting the bill, basically. They were upset in the East that the Western churches weren't standing up and helping to pay for the institution and the fact that uh, there were overruns every year in the budget for, during the 1870s. And they decided, of course, to close the theological department as a result of that lack of financial support. Now, after, uh, in 1878, after approving measures to correct the mismanagement of Hope College, the General Senate appointed a a committee of three, how do you like to be on this committee? A committee of three to come to Holland, Michigan and receive the resignations of the professors of theology, which had been supported by the General Synod, and the president. The committee found the task of, of securing the resignation of Phelps to be particularly onerous because they really admired uh, Phelps. But they carried out the will of the Synod and uh, 
by the way, the Senate had declared when they sent them, it sometimes become ne becomes necessary to sacrifice men to save institutions. Now Phelps was deeply grieved and hurt by this, insisting that his resignation was forced illegally according to the constitution of the college. Believing that he was still a legitimate president of Hope College, uh, for six years he stayed in his quarters. And by the way, the quarters of the president were located uh, on one of the floors and even stretched to two of the floors of Van Vleck Hall, which was, by the way, the basic center of the institution. It was the major building at that time, which had been built in, uh, in earlier in, uh, in the time of the academy. Uh, it was the place for, for classroom studies, for administrators to stay, student housing, as well as the president's residence. Now, when I informed my granddaughter, who recently resided at Van Vleck Hall, about the history of her dormitory, she looked at me in utter disbelief. That little dormitory was the very center for everything that happened at Hope College. Now, in 1884, after seeing his daughter Frances graduate from the college, one of the first two women graduates of Hope College, he eventually left, vacated the hall, and eventually accepted a call to become a pastor in a church in New York State. According to his great-granddaughter, Phelps never quite got over being relieved from the presidency of Hope College. It broke his heart. Fifth, did you know that Andrew Carnegie, the steel magnet, funded the building of a lovely gymnasium on Hope's campus? Well, a small wooden structure had been built in 1862 to serve the academy as a gymnasium and as a chapel. That must have been an interesting uh, combination. <laughs> um, by the end of the 19th century, that gym chapel had proven inadequate for the, for the college. So, by the way, it had been built by Hope students who hewed the lumber from, from the woods that was nearby. This was done, this was student labor and it was built by the students. There are some pictures, we think, of students uh, around the finished uh, gymnasium chapel. In 1902, when students petitioned the administration to repair and equip the old gymnasium chapel, they wanted a gym. It was decided that the structure was not worth repairing and that a fund was begun to uh, raise money to uh, build another gymnasium. Three years later, President Garrett Collin an early graduate of the college and a former professor of the college, informed the governing council that Andrew Carnegie had offered to donate $20,000 to build a gymnasium on the condition that an equal amount of money be given to support the endowment of Hope College. Now, like most funds which were raised by the college, Carnegie's gift was facilitated by folks in the East, by uh, RCA members in the eastern part of America. Donald Sage Mackay, who was the pastor of St. Nicholas Reformed Church in New York City, had been on campus to speak on the, the, the college week or the prayer for colleges week, and he noted the need for a gymnasium and a chapel. When uh, Carnegie was not a member of the St. Nicholas, while well, he was not a member of that church, he did attend when he was in New York City. And so it was through the offices of Dr. Mackay that Colin became acquainted with Carnegie. And they became friends, actually. And uh, Colin convinced Carnegie to, do to donate $20,000 to build a gymnasium which bore his name. Carnegie had not done this previously, support uh, colleges with gymnasiums, but uh, his relationship with Colin made that possible. In fact, when the structure was completed, Carnegie denoted, do donated $10,000 more to meet uh, additional costs, and he gave $20,000 to support the college endowment. A remarkable engagement of Carnegie and Colin. Now, when I arrived at Hope in 1977 to teach, the Carnegie gym still stood. And while it was still too small to meet the needs of the college at that time, it was a stately, impressive structure. And many of you here who came from this area or went to Hope College know uh, Carnegie Gymnasium. It was demolished in 1979 when the, uh, um, the Dow Physical Education Center was built to replace it. Six, did you know that Hope College was a training site for uh, the military, the U.S. military in World War I and World War II? On May 3rd, 
1918, the Secretary of War sent letters to colleges, all the colleges and universities in the United States, inviting them to participate in a program to provide military instruction during the First World War. Now, after considerable discussion and consternation, President Dimnant and the Council of Hope approved uh, 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 the establishment of a unit of the what was called the Student Army Training Corps. Now, this unit was composed of uh, regular Army personnel, or at least it was commanded by regular Army personnel. Gymnasium, uh, the uh, Carnegie Gymnasium served as a barracks, a canteen, and an officer's quarters. Van Vleck Hall was used as a dispensary and an infirmary. The third floor of Van Ralty Hall, which some of us remember, uh, maybe not so fondly, but Van Ralty Hall, before it burned in front of our eyes. The third floor of Van Ralty served as a kitchen and a mess hall. And members of the Corps were in uniform, and they were under military discipline, and they did march to and from classes and chapel services. Now, tensions developed on the campus, apparently, as regular students resented the military corps dominating the campus, and members of the corps resented the male students for not being in uniform. You can imagine. And not surprisingly, the military commander had some tensions or some uh, tiffs with President Dimnant over the issues of authority of the camp on campus. The tension did not last long as the war ended, and in December 1918, the Corps disbanded. On the positive side for Hope College, the Student Army Training Corps kept a significant number of students on campus during a time when campuses were, were losing students to the war effort. And the government afterward provided significant funds to uh, pay for this Army Training Unit, uh, helped to mitigate the financial constraints during this time. Now, enrollment during the Second World War uh, was uh, the declines, at least, in the enrollment were even more dramatic than the, during the First World War, as many male students left colleges and uh, joined the Army or the Navy or the Air Force. Now, of course, the loss of students sharply impacted the financial condition of the college. From September 1942 to March 1944, Hope was a war college. In the fall of 1942, the college uh, contracted with the Army for the establishment of a, of a campus, uh, on the campus of a unit of the Army Special Training Program. This unit consisted of a battalion of 258 men from 36 states who were high school graduates between the ages of 18 and 22. The curriculum for this battalion consisted of basic engineering taught by the Hope faculty and military uh, instruction taught by the Army officers. Carnegie Hall, our Carnegie Gymnasium became the mess hall and the drill hall. Van Vleck became the sick bay and the dispensary. And the Army, Army unit was allowed to participate in all college activities except intercollegiate athletics. These men were required to attend the chapel and they spent time, they had to spend time in the library. That's a wonderful way to get students in the library. <laughs> Matter of fact, they had to march there. Uh, Marion Smith over there was a student at that time. Marion, uh, you remember students, uh, these, army, uh, uh, these army members marching to and from chapel and from classrooms. So uh, participation in this program, which ended in 1944, did help the college because the government paid a significant fund for, uh, for the, to the college at the end, and we put it into the uh, endowment of the institution. Seventh, did you know that before the second, and by the way, there is this, just, I, Betty's going to kill me, but I'm just going to show the, this book by uh, Eileen uh, Nordstrom and George Zeidema, uh, The War Years at the Crossroads, Hope College at, uh, at the Crossroads. And uh, there are incredible pictures of Hope College during the Second World War and the soldiers on campus. Seven, did you know that before the Second World War, a remarkably high percentage of Hope College graduates became full-time religious leaders? As was the case for most denominational colleges started in the uh, uh, 19th century, a prime motivation, as we know, was to prepare pastors and missionaries and teachers. Van Ralty and the Western colonists, as well as the leaders of the Eastern Reformed Church, had this shared vision for the future of the church. Now, at this point, Hope College delivered, especially during the early century, the first century of our existence as an institution, Hope produced an extraordinary number of religious leaders. 
The college catalog in 1890 uh, noted that 65% of all graduates up to that time, between 1866 and 18, uh, 1866 and 89, had entered what they called full-time denominational service. An incredible percentage. During the 50th anniversary year in 1916, a survey of the uh, of alums revealed that out of a total of, of uh, 561 graduates, 358, more than 60 percent, had become ministers, missionaries, or theological teachers. Twelve years later, a similar analysis revealed that out of a total of 1,410 graduates, 60 percent could be identified as religious leaders. And because of such a high percentage of the students in those days were members of the Reformed Church, most of those leaders, most of those leaders were serving the Reformed Church in America. As late as 1941, one-third of all graduates uh, became pastors or missionaries. Moreover, 42% in that year, 42% of all ministers in the Reformed Church had graduated from, the, from Hope College. Now, during the last 50 years, our college has gained an incredibly wonderful reputation for producing scientists and physicians, uh, but it has produced also through the unique Christian dimension of the college, it continues to attract and to nurture uh, leaders of the church of many different backgrounds. And I consider this to be one of the remarkable fruits of Hope College. Sixth, uh, eighth, did you know that today the denominational constituency of students at Hope College is very ecumenical? Hope College has never required a religious test for enrollment, never, from the very, very beginning. Even when the college was governed by the denomination, even when the college was supported almost completely by the denomination, all religious groups were welcomed. In fact, the first constitution of the college was very explicit on that point. And uh, it, it, it said that uh, all students were to be admitted to all of its advantages without respect to their ecclesiastical memberships, subject only to the rules and regulations of the institution. Early on, of course, most of the students were members of the Reformed Church or related Reformed tradition uh, denominations. And then, of course, they attracted eventually a lot of students from the East, from New, Jer New York and New Jersey, and that kept the overall percentage up as well. During the early 1960s, the percentage of RCA students was about 45 percent, and we have all the stats on that, and that will be in, in the book. The percentage of RCA students has continued to decline since uh, uh, that time. Uh, in, in 1977, uh, about one-third of the membership of the student body was Reformed Church. And about 19, in 18, 1980, about 25% were self-identified as RCA. In 2015, the percentage had fallen to about 9%. Today, the student body at Hope College reflects the religious makeup uh, the diversity of Christianity in the United States. During the 2015-16 academic year, there were 311 RCA students on campus, and uh, however, there were uh, twice as many Roman Catholics, which is typical for Protestant uh, institutions today, or most of them. So, while Hope remains a vital Christian institution, proudly organized by the Reformed Church in America, and deeply rooted into the Reformed tradition and associated today with the Reformed Church in America, uh, it is an ecumenical institution. Ninth, did you know that Hope College basketball games have been played at six different venues in Holland? These are the really big, important issues. <laughs> now, I'm aware that many of you uh, share my passion for Hope College basketball and that you also attend games at the Voss Stadium. Uh, to my mind, the best facility for basketball, uh, regardless of division, in America. Now, since 1977, my friend David Myers and I have missed very few women's or men's games, and we talk basketball throughout the year, and uh, we consider ourselves the best coaches in the bleachers. <laughs> now, you'll notice here uh, in the front, Elliot Tannis and Vern Skipper, and in the back, a much younger version of Dave and, and me. Uh, he looks like a child there. <laughs> anyway, uh, basketball has been played at Hope College since 1900 at least, when 18 Hope women called the Basket Club <laughs> were photographed in the first uh, gymnasium, that little wooden structure. 
posing in front of a basket which had been attached to the gallery uh, on, the, on the balcony of the uh, uh, gallery of the gym. Men's, uh, men, uh, women, hopes women, men had played intramural games in the gym at least uh, as well as, as early as that. And uh, that wooden building, by the way, of course, was built in 1862. The gym chapel, located just southeast of uh, Van Vleck Hall today, served as a basketball facility until 1906 when Carnegie uh, Gymnasium was built. Carnegie served as the basketball venue until 1931 uh, when, per request of the Calvin College coach who, th coach who thought that Carnegie was a, uh, a home field advantage, a home court advantage for Hope College, demanded that we move it to the armory downtown here on 9th Street. Uh, and we did. Uh, so for, for a while it was played at the Armory. Um, now, in 1954, the Holland Civic Center became the citadel of Hope College basketball. Now, I never saw a game at Carnegie Hall. I never saw a game at the Armory. Uh, but I've always wondered what it was like to play in those venues because they were small uh, to even hold many uh, spectators and say nothing of the, of, the, of the courts that were not very large for the players. So I, I wonder what the Hope Calvin games were like in those days. <laughs> now some of you, I'm sure, how many have attended games in either the Armory or in, yeah, so uh, you are, you bear witness, you, you testify to the truth of this statement. Now, um, now the Civic Center was a different matter as 2,500 people or so could get squeezed into that institution when the fire marshal wasn't watching. <laughs> I remember Calvin Games when we were squeezed in like sardines. Okay, please move to the middle. Move to the middle. Thank you. Move to the middle. And then the fire marshal found out what we were doing. <laughs> the first Calvin College men's game that I saw at the Civic Center blew my mind. The intensity, the passion, the drama, the spirited nature of the students who would boo and I was almost embarrassed until I got into the mood and joined them. <laughs> and I was among those 10,000 folks that claimed to have been at that Civic Center when Hope's Women won the national championship there uh, in 1990, the miracle on Ninth Street coming back from 20 points in the last five minutes, I think. Uh, that made it absolutely true, but it was close to that. Anyway, both Hope men and women played some games at the Dow Center when it opened because uh, one of the coaches in the conference decided that it wasn't long enough, the Civic Center, to have playoff games in it. So the women played in the Dow Center most of the time. And for playoff games, we went to the Dow as well and couldn't find a place to sit. And uh, there just wasn't enough room for the spectators that would go to playoff games. So finally, the DeVos Fieldhouse is where teams began to play in the 2006-07 basketball season. Already, many of us had cherished memories of the of magnificent uh, games in, those, in the DeVos Fieldhouse. And the Hope teams have had remarkable winning records there. The frenzy continues this year, of course, as both teams uh, put wonderful teams on the court. And uh, go Hope, I can say that. <laughs> Tenth, finally, did you know, as we celebrate the 150th anniversary of Hope, that just 12 inaugurated presidents have served the college. Just 12 in 150 years. There was unusual stability. There has been unusual stability and longevity in the presidency at Hope College. Two presidents served just seven years. That's the shortest period. But all others served between 12 and 18 years apiece. Considering the challenges of leading a college, the stability of Hope College leaders is quite remarkable, I think. It denotes a culture of shared values among faculty and staff, support and encouragement from the Board of Trustees, and outstanding presidential leadership. So, President Knapp, take heed and settle in for a long stay. <laughs> well, these are some of the 10 things that I wanted to share with you that you might not know about Hope College uh, during this ses sesquicentennial uh, anniversary year. I want to thank the program committee for uh, having me do this. This is something that I hadn't planned or is not part of the book that we're writing uh, and the chapter that I'm writing in the book, but it's been a lot of fun. I have to thank my wife, Betty. I have to thank uh, Beth Smith, who was there with her mother. She assisted me uh, by helping with this at Western Seminary, uh, where she no longer has to assist me. 
and my colleagues at the Ben Rowley Institute, many of them who are here, and uh, uh, they have been a, a, a delight to know and to contribute to this ongoing discussion that we have every, every day about uh, the Dutch American culture in, uh, in, around our table. It's my hope that this little presentation will spur interest, further interest in the history of Hope College. And of course, I have to remind you that you can read all you want to know when that book is published, Jack. And uh, it's going to be called Keeping Hope Alive, A Sesquicentennial History of Hope College. And uh, I'm certainly looking forward to it. Thank you very, very much. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Betty told me this would be way too long for questions if I didn't go faster and went faster and faster. Uh, but uh, there is time, right? Could you tell us a little bit more about the Van Ralty Institute? Whew. I didn't plant that question. <laughs> well, the Van Ralty Institute uh, uh, was begun under the, uh, uh, the leadership of President Jacobson and uh, Elton Bruins was the founding father of it and uh, it is an institute um, which has been uh, able to and dedicated to studying Dutch American uh, culture, especially in the Midwest because there is such an uh, organization in the East and we met with them uh, in Albany this year. It was a wonderful conference. And I want to say that the Van Ralty folks who gave the presentations, and many of them were Van Ralty folks, were absolutely excellent and I think uh, uh, made a reputation for themselves which will last. So that's what it, we're about. We do things uh, having to do with uh, Dutch communities, Dutch American communities. Uh, we intersect with Dutch uh, American scholars in the Netherlands. And um, uh, we've branched out to study the colleges, the communities, and uh, so it's a, a broader, a broad ranging now in terms of our reach and our interest. And we're very pleased to be part of the college. Uh, and uh, most of us are, are not full-time uh, employees of the college, but we uh, love what we do and we're very pleased for the space. We are in the Tile Building, which is on 10th Street down toward uh, the uh, Central Avenue and uh, uh, you're always welcome to visit and be shown the Institute. I think you ought to add an 11th unusual fact that very few people know about. Of the first six graduates, two were Japanese, one was the valedictorian and gave his address in Latin. Well, <laughs> yes, I, I, have, I hate to correct my dear friend and uh, uh, the former president of the seminary, they, they weren't in that first class. They were in a later class. I think, uh, help me over here, that the Japanese students began to come in 1870, 70? 70, 72, you see, just go to Elton or Jack or someone over there, Bob, they know everything. So yeah, it was later, but they were uh, the first students from outside uh, the United States, as far as I know, and uh, they did make their mark. Uh, and that continued relationship between the college uh, and, the, uh, and, and the Japanese culture and students continues with a Meiji Gakuen uh, term that my son actually was part of one summer. But you're right, it's a very early. Yes? When did the Dutch Reform Church become the RCA? 1867, at one of the two General Synod meetings that were held in those years. There were a few years where they had an October and a June meeting. That's more than they want to know, but that was the year that they actually changed the name. And uh, I think it's a good thing they should have done it 100 years earlier. Because uh, it was really difficult in America to grow when your uh, ethnic identity is part of your denominational name. Yes, other questions? Please. I wondered how long the basketball tradition existed at Hope. When did they start playing? And, and the same as to football. When did football become a sport at the college? And where did they play at the big field? I've got a book for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> Ray, 
Randy Vanderwater wrote this, 100 Years of Hope College Basketball. And boy, I mean, this is in detail about all the games up until more recent years. And uh, uh, it's difficult to know when they actually started playing. I know that the college was reluctant to support athletics for a long while, early on. As a matter of fact, the students would petition, the administrators would say, no, uh, that's not gentlemanly, or that's not in our tradition, or whatever. And therefore, it took a while to break through, even for basketball, which seemed like a a sport that would be less expensive. So um, uh, it goes back, I mean, you can read here and find out when we first started playing in a conference. We're not one of the charter members of the MIAA. We came a little bit later. But we've been playing basketball a long while, but not as, as long as a lot of the students wanted to play uh, co competitive basketball. Dennis, this fall we begin our 108th football season. 108th football season, yes. That means, yeah, and, and earlier than that, there were students wanting to play football and they kind of put teams together and they had to kind of go around the administration to, uh, to actually go someplace. Matter of fact, they, they were banned from playing for a while. They, they got in trouble. <laughs> they thought that was, uh, that, 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 that was frivolous and uh, took away from the real purpose of Hope College. And they're right. I mean, the administrators were right. Uh, I've served on the uh, committee for Hope College uh, as a member of the MIAA faculty group that gets together and, and uh, we do take sports seriously, but we don't cheat. <laughs> we don't, well, I can't go into that. <laughs> I, 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 yes, Bob. The first sport was baseball. Baseball, yes. And they have, there was a picture that we, that you couldn't see very well, it was very grainy, where you had some baseball players, right now where the, the hole is being dug for the, uh, the, the Boltman Center, that was an open field and uh, down below Carnegie Hall where that was, or Van Black Hall, and they, you can see them in uniforms actually. And there were some people watching it and so forth. But so they did play baseball earlier and there's even that picture to substantiate that. And they probably have it on the records. Bob, Bob knows everything about Hope, Western, and the universe of everything. So I'm not gonna mess with Bob. <laughs> baseball probably was the first sport. It would make sense too. Uh, other questions, observations, yes. When did the, um or how did the relationship with Saros Patek, Hungarian reform, get established? And how did that come about? I, I think that's a well, relatively long-standing as well. I do know, and I'm not, I haven't read up on this. I know that the seminary's connection has been there a long while as well. Um, Eugene Osterhaven, who taught for a while at Hope and then came to the seminary as a theological professor, uh, his wife is Hungarian in background. And that's where we, we, we really begin to tie in. Uh, but there, there have been Hungarian Reformed uh, Church students. I mean, the Hungarian side of the Reformed tradition has been part of this. And they visited here and at the seminary. So I know it goes back a ways. I don't, I've not read up on that history, though. But it's a good question. Yes. You described early on about how the folks back east supported the uh, development of Hope College. Could you? Bring us up to date as to how that evolved over the years and where do things stand uh, today with anybody back east? Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to remember that um, when Ben Ralty brought uh, the colonial reform church, the, 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 this colony, the more recent Dutch, there are two waves of immigrants I talk about. The first wave, which would be New Amsterdam, and, and that, when the English came, that kind of cut down. You didn't have many people coming. And, becoming part of the Reformed Church at that time. And the second wave starts in the 1840s. 1847 here in Wisconsin, uh, where, my, where my family starts in 1847 there. And uh, uh, Ben Ralty, despite the fact that he was part of this a group called the Ofscatting that separated from the state church in the Netherlands, he was very ecumenical. And he really looked at the Reformed Church uh, in the East. They supported him as he came. They, he wanted to join with that group. And he brought, sometimes with some reluctance on the part of uh, some other people in the Midwest, brought those churches that were being organized early on into the Reformed Church in America. They were just a pittance, just a small part of the Reformed Church overall. The large section until the turn of the, of the 19th century basically was in the East. That was, they were the powerhouse. And they very hospitably welcomed these Dutch immigrants, and happily so, because it helped them to have a Western presence. That's the, that's the whole reason for the Hope College on their, on their, on their part. So 
Uh, eventually, however, the Midwest became stronger and stronger and stronger. And today, uh, the Midwestern Reformed churches and, and those that have gone west of this area, they, they use the word west for Midwest in those days. If they talk about we need a presence in the west, they meant about the Mississippi area. And um, uh, so eventually it switched, and the Midwestern Reformed Church churches became the dominant uh, churches around the turn of the, uh, the 20th century. But still, there was parity kind of every other year uh, electing officers either from the east and the next year from the west. That began to break down in the 1990s and 80s already. 